Hello everyone, we're here at Ryan Enterprise Ryan Built with a really cool project and a really great racer. This is Will Cronkright, if you don't know already, and behind us is the skinny car. So if you've never heard the story, this is the car in 1982 that ran above 203 miles an hour at Talladega and Happy Hour and unofficially was the fastest NASCAR for I think three years. If I remember correctly, I, I think so as well. It was it the uh, the speed was beat. I think three years later by Cale Yarborough. Yep. So we're going to talk to Will in detail about what made him think that he could get away with building a car two and a half inches narrow and then taking it to Talladega and flying around the racetrack. We're also I know there's some neat stories about Junior Johnson and this thing and some 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 just some really fun stuff and some great great history that you haven't heard yet. So um, that's what we're here for. That's what we're going to get into, and uh, I guess we're going to get started. So, Will, my first question for you. 1982, you get the Jolly Rancher sponsor. You guys have 10 or so races to do for them that year. You got EFR driving. Yes, sir. Good driver. Um, what made you think, hey, I'm going to build a skinny car? And, and how skinny, and, and you know what, I know how your brain works as far as the mathematics <laughs> and, the, and the build process, so what went through your brain well, to, to it, do this and then to make it work? The impetus for this car actually got started in 1975 when I worked for Donnie Allison when we were in Daytona Beach with Die Guard. We had an opportunity to go over there and kind of sneak in where the, where the tour bus goes and watch people when they rented the Daytona racetrack and and I would go over there and eat lunch and I noticed that the cars that went off over the tunnel turn all the real fast cars seemed to settle down within about a two second time frame and I don't know what made me notice that but it just seemed like the fast cars settled quicker at that same time in 75 we built the car that sat on the pole for the Daytona 500 and the motor was built by uh, Grumpy Jenkins okay and I was the car chief at the time, but I hung around Rossi because Rossi was one of my, Mario Rossi was one of my instrumental fellows in, when I was in racing. And so I'd help him in the motor room after the daytime stuff. And that motor, when I took the valve springs off, had valve covers off, had three valve springs. I'd never seen that before. And so I'm talking to Rossi and he, he went through this deal about harmonics. And that just sort of settled in my mind. And so a year, oh, not even a year later, it dawned on me. My goal was going to be to try to monitor wheel frequencies in a two-second time frame where they did not harmonic with each other. That was my thinking that those cars settled down in two seconds was because somehow their spring arrangement was such that they didn't oscillate against each other mm -hmm. after within a two-second time frame. So I got to thinking that if I could monitor the wheels in a manner that the frequencies didn't interact with each other for two seconds, I was going to have to have a platform that would not harmonic in that same time frame. And I didn't have the mental capacity to figure that out. So I just assumed stiff was going to be where I would go till I could figure it out. So I started building cars. And then when I got in, this would have been in 19, probably 79 or 80, I started building fixtures in my shop. We had the capacity to build our own snouts, our rear clips, and the whole frame. And I've got some pictures I think you've seen yeah. where I made a fixture to go overhead so I could make the chassis the way I wanted, set the chassis the way I wanted, and then mount the body on it to fit different racetracks, whichever one we applied for. So th this car is the third of the three cars that I built with my attempt at having a stiff chassis. Mm -hmm. And the way that I did that was, I think when we toured the shop this last time over to our little reunion, yes. there were some inserts in the floor. And in that place is where I started measuring torsional rigidity. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I, I built posts that would go underneath the screw jacks, no springs. They'd hold a car at ride height with posts under each of the screw jacks places, except the right rear, I'd take that post out and I b built a turnbuckle arrangement that locked into the floor, and then I would tighten that turnbuckle 
until it, there was just no tension at all under the left front wheel, under the left front screw jack, and I had a 10-foot bar, a bar that was 10 feet from the center of the car to the hook. And I would turn that turnbuckle to the, you could put a piece of business card underneath the, the screw jack mm -hmm. and the post, and I took that post out. So now there was nothing under the left front, fixed points at the right front and the left rear, and this turnbuckle at the rear. And then when I got that situated, I put a 500 pound, before that, I put uh, 10 dial indicators along the chassis, mm -hmm. and then and zero them, and then I'd put a 500 pound weight. It was a motor that had stuff in it till it weighed 500 pounds, and I put it on that, so I had 500 pounds times 10 feet. I knew what my torsional rigidity was of that frame by measuring the change in the readings in the dial indicator. And I learned from that that the biggest part of the flex was in the front end. And I fancy myself a little bit of a vehicle dynamics mm -hmm. enthusiast. And if the front end is flexing more than the center section or the rear, and the roll center in the front is subject to you know control arm movement, very little movement in the rear roll center, a lot of movement in the front roll center, and, and so I got really concerned about a lot of movement in the frame where the suspension was given the most flex, and so I that just made that terrible. The, the rear would stay same, but the front to roll center height would just go all over. So I did some stuff to stiffen the front clip to minimize the change in the roll center heights, and to do that I put the screw jack uh, over the screw jack, I ran that post and then triangulated. I call this a double Y design where I got two lines come off the the main main section and join up here at this post. Mm -hmm. And then that bar went across the top. And, and before I did that, the common cars, Hutcherson, Pagan, Banjos, and our cars were twisting at about 7,800 foot pounds per degree. Um, a banjo car without a body was 7,900 foot-pounds. A Hutcherson Pagan car with a body on it, just, just the sheet metal, was 86. And the, this, this car right here twisted at 12,150 foot-pounds per degree. So I wow. achieved what I, was, yep. what I was trying to do. I, I don't know how viable that would be from safety concerns now, but it, it, that's that's what I was trying to yeah. do, and that did work. And when we had this car at Talladega, the, the design is such that the upper control arms go around that post. Right. And if you if you don't look real carefully, it looks like you can't take that upper control arm off and change it. And Bud Moore actually came down, <laughs> said I was dumber than a bag of hammers, <laughs> and, and then I showed didn't it. Think you get the A frame off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then I told him to count the <laughs> count the bolts, and he. <laughs> <laughs> he figured that out. Mm. So I learned early, I learned from Rossi that the, you, you can increase your speed with the square of the change in horsepower, mm -hmm. but you can make that same improvement in speed by a, a reduction, by a cube of the reduction in drag. So it, it, it was obvious to me, my goal was always to chase aerodynamics. Yeah. I just, so I did a lot of stuff, countersinking rivets and that. And then it just became clear, you know, when, you pu when you're pushing air, the smaller box. smaller box you're pushing, the faster that thing will yeah. go. And I wasn't a real keen body man, so I just figured we'd try to build us a car where we didn't have to do body work. You'll, you'll notice on this car, there's no flares on the rear fender. Yes. And we were fortunate enough to have a Good driver at the time, Elliot Forbes Robinson. I, it, I'm very impressed with his background, how quickly he adjusted to the stock car racing. Very impressed with Elliot. And we had him um, for a number of races with the, the uh, Jolly Rancher people. So we, was, we were comfortable that we had a good shoe. Um, what, what, what was I talking about? The, the aerodynamics and narrow. Oh, the, yeah, the aerodynamic yeah. narrow of the car. Yeah. And I wasn't a top name competitor, and I didn't count on it, but it was pretty obvious they weren't looking at me very carefully. And I had simultaneously, <laughs> about the time we were working with... You, you were taking advantage of anonymity. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what it is. And it turned out, it turned out 
I got away with at least one race. Um, and at the same time, we picked up the, the Jolly Rancher people. I had a little bit of a budget that I hadn't had before. And so I, um, Junior Johnson was, has always been good to me. He mm-hmm. sold me some radios that used to belong to Daryl Waltrip. And he's just, he just was always kind to me and answered a lot of questions when I was thinking about writing a book. And so I asked him one time if he would consider rebuilding my motors. I thought it was a long shot, and he thought about it for a little bit, and we were at a racetrack, and he said, I'll, let me think about it. But he came back in an hour, and he said, yeah, he said, here's what we'll do. He said, I'll, you bring me the motor, mm-hmm. your stuff, I'll, I will rebuild it for you, mm-hmm. but when you get it, you don't, you don't tell anybody that it came from me, mm-hmm. and don't you touch nothing. Yeah. Don't muck with any bolts. Yep. And we ran pretty good at Atlanta, um, and this particular motor, I write in my book about two cops and a cannon where I accidentally shot the neighbor's house with a cannon. Um, <laughs> that, that motor that was on that dyno at that time when the police came was, was the motor that was going in this car to go to Talladega. So I, I had just put it on there. We were just uh, trying headers, I think. We were trying to decide where we are going to put the balance to between the headers. So it's a junior motor, and we go to Talladega, and Benny qualifies 200 and a little bit. Yes. I don't remember where junior qualified, but we qualified 18th. We were 198 and a little bit, I guess, 198 and a lot. And uh, for the life of me, the biggest mistake I've ever made was not putting new tires on to qualify. We'd crashed a cart at Atlanta, so th- it, we got pressed into service. This was going to be an R&D car. But mm-hmm. It was meant to be aero, an aerodynamic car. The next race was Talladega, and it was easier to finish this car than it was to fix the, well, the Atlanta, Atlanta car. Hurt, the the Atlanta hurt. car was tore up pretty yeah. bad, really bad. Um, so we put, obviously, we put Junior's motor in the car. We go down there, and then after, my big mistake was not putting new tires on. Mm-hmm. For some reason, my logic was hard tires were going to be better. <laughs> I, I just admitted that yeah. was a mistake. Yeah. So, so I we I did qualified on the old Talladega tires, but we came in and put new tires on. Elliot said there was he was having a little bit of a problem with it darting a little bit. So I laid a little more caster to both front mm-hmm. wheels. We made a we made a jet change, a, a one number jet change, and went out in practice and we went two oh three, one twenty four or something, yeah. and it drew a crowd. It drew a crowd so bad. We just put the hood down <laughs> and went back and sat on them big two them big the benches there. Benches yeah. that, yep. that are there at Talladega. We're sitting there watching. That was when Bud Moore came down, raised the hood. Mm-hmm. He didn't ask. He just raised yeah. the hood, <laughs> looked at them ball joints, and he says, "Come here." Like so, I come up here and he says, "You know, you're dumb with a bag of hammers. You're never going to be able to get that upper control arm changed." <laughs> and it, that's my Bud Moore yeah. story. But then Junior came down because Junior and Junior he, knew what the motor was. And he was mad. Well, originally. he wasn't. He wasn't too tickled because he, he, you know, he, he's a pretty bright boy. Yeah. He, everybody knew he was brighter than me. Yeah. He wanted if he could raise the hood, and so I asked him. He could. He pulled four hood pins off and raised the hood and looks at it and he looks around and he goes around to that side of the car and he's still holding the hood up. He has got it on the latch as he's holding the hood. He looks at it and. Comes around, looks in the middle. He comes over on this side and looks at it. And he just looks at me and he twists his head like, you know, what the hell did you do here? And he, he, you know, he knew what the motor was and he yeah. knew I wasn't a motor guy, so yeah. he knew I. He was. I think he was worried somebody else had played yes, with yeah. his motor. Yep. So he put the he put the hood down, put the four hood pins in it, and he started to walk away. And we're standing, we're sitting back there, and he's over there with that pin he put in last, and he just looks at the car and he walks up and as he's walking off he looked down this side of this side of the car you know junior got them bib overalls he puts his hands in there and he takes two steps and i see him stop turn around look at that car and he just he he didn't turn around he just backed up two steps and looked down the side of that car (laughs) went like that and walked off that's how sharp he was it it only took him that long to figure it out he saw there was no fender flares and he figured he figured that out and it was a it was it was a little bit more than two inches narrow, and it had been narrower than that if I could have figured out another way to shorten the lower yeah. control arms. So. Yeah. 
you've, you've done an outstanding job putting that thing back in there, Bill. I'm so proud so, of it. So one of my guys, I'm, I'm going to say this story. You know this story because you helped us verify this is the real car. Um, but for everybody out there, so they know the real story, we found this car in New Jersey. It came up for sale. It had a Monte Carlo body on it, an Aerocoupe Monte Carlo body. And one of my employees found it and said, oh, I'm going to buy this car at a vintage race. And he starts showing me all these pictures. Well, we see the front clip on it. And knowing from talking with Will and working with Will that there was only four or five of these front clips yeah, built. Four. Um, so I tell my guy, I'm like, that's one of Will's cars. We need to get that. So I make a deal with my guy. He buys the car basically for us, for Ryan Enterprise, because I didn't want to you know, muddy the water up and make some guy think that too many people want his car because then the price goes yep, up. Yep, yep. We get the car back here. Will comes up and starts looking at it and brings us photographs from his archives of the skinny car chassis on the rotisserie up on its side. In the old days, they were black floor pans you'd get from Hudson Pagan to, to put yeah, in your race right, cars. Yeah, right. And the black paint was, was, was stripped off, and there were these two aluminum strips where the floor pan was sectioned and put back together, as well as the, 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 the brace bar in the left front corner that comes around the firewall. Uh, there, was just, there was so many things on this car that were exactly like the photographs from your shop. And... Um, a little bit more research, a little bit more looking, and, and we figured out. So the skinny car left your possession and went to Yellow 38, the, uh, what was that gentleman's name? Uh, engine builder. Uh, yes. Uh, Keith. Oh, gosh. <laughs> his name's Keith. Yeah, I know. I can't remember his last name. I feel <laughs> bad now because yeah. he came by and he's a super nice guy. Um, he ran it as a skinny Buick. And then somehow it ended up in Bosco Lowe's possession. or Bosco, Bosco Lowe's was, was, a, was driving the car for him. Okay, well, at some point when Bosco had it, they put the Monte Carlo body on it and widened it back up. So when we got it, we did have to make it skinny again. Uh, the nice thing is the dash, the roof, A, B, and C posts, uh, all of door tops, all of that was still original. They never cut any of that off. They just added the Monte Carlo stuff and kind of pieced it in. So it was easy to take it back to original. Um, we narrowed up the A-frames like we discussed. We you know, had a, a narrower end housing put together for it. Um, but she's back just like she was as far as dimensions to, to yeah, you know. nice, Nicely done too. I'm really impressed with how accurately you put that thing back together, Bill. I'm impressed. Well, you were a big help. We well, couldn't I, have done it without I, the information. I also see we, in those pictures, we noticed the extra in, inner control arm pivot. Yes, pivot holes, yep. Lower control arm inner pivot point holes been yes. changed. Yep. So it's um, oh, you've done a nice job. We're gonna try to get it together soon and bring it to a, a show before the end of the year, and kind of surprise everybody with it. Um, so you surprised me with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. So, so a lot of y'all don't know. We also have the car he talked about crashing in Atlanta with EFR. We found that car outside of Asheville, between Asheville and Hendersonville, three quarters of a mile up a goat trail, and not a dirt road, but a goat trail. Under a um, barn. Under a barn. It took two days to drag the car back to a gravel road <laughs> with a tractor. Um, had to cut locks off of about three different fences. Um, that was quite an expedition, but that's actually the car that I got that, that introduced us to you. One of my friends, Johnny Dolan, yeah. who had the car here, <laughs> was at an autograph signing with you, and he, I guess he was standing somewhere near you and he's like, hey, you need to talk to my buddy here. And, and you didn't know me from Adam at the time. No, I had no idea. And uh, he was nice enough to come out, look at that car for us as well, verify that, yeah, that was the Atlanta car. The neat thing about the Atlanta car is after it got wrecked, it got repaired to be the Aubrey James car in Stroker Race. So it's the end of its racing career was in the Stroker Race movie. Um, and actually, when we found it, it still had the Aubrey James paint scheme on it and the I don't know, five-star <laughs> whiskey or four-star yeah. whiskey hand-lettered on the deck lid and stuff. That um, car had carpet on the floor and all the roll bars were padded. Yeah. It had a windshield wiper motor welded to the yes. firewall under the hood. Somebody <laughs> had tried to make it street, street legal, car, yes, and didn't. Uh, wasn't very successful. But that one's restored and goes to shows with us, and Will uses it for different things as well. Um, this one will be so. So, what did Elliot say in the race? You guys ran good in the race. There's there's a YouTube video that shows him running with Bobby Allison at Talladega. That we're we're scooting along really well. I want to say you guys were in the top five. That that top five pack. Yes. And you came up on a lap car that happened to blow the motor at the perfect wrong time, and and yeah. uh, four or three of the leaders were taken out in the wreck. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was, it was a pretty 
pretty b bad wreck. That same old crap happens at Talladega. Mm -hmm. Somebody, yeah. Some yay who muddies the water. Wow. How long did it take you to put this together in the shop? Because you, you had six guys, five guys? We've had, I had five guys. Um, it was actually just done a little bit at, at a time. And okay. after, after I developed that double Y front clip, um, we, we built it on this. It's a stock front clip. Mm -hmm. um, the rear end is narrowed. So we probably worked on it. It was two years probably between the time I started and the time I finished because we were doing it, you know. Off and on, yeah. yeah we're between trying, all we, the other work. Yeah, we're is, trying yeah. to race and build cars. And, between uh, the 20-hour days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wanted to be a race car guy back yeah. in the day. 